on today's podcast. Mary was in her young 20s and couldn't drive, couldn't go to school, couldn't see her friends because every time she would get in the car, she'd have a panic attack. And it was like really debilitating her and was being completely sidelined by this thing that she felt like she had no control over. She'd been to every therapist, had used every tool and still could not stop this. And so we did. Within a month, her panic attacks were gone. Hmm. She's been panic attack free for over a year and a half. Wow. And this is like the level of hope I want folks at home to feel is like when I tell you like we can stop this, I mean it. If you're a healthcare provider tired of just treating symptoms and ready to dig deeper into the root causes of health issues, the Vibrant Wellness Podcast is for you. With insider tips, expert interviews, and the latest in biotech research, this podcast will take your patient care to the next level. Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to another enlightening episode of the Vibrant Wellness Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Jen Rivas, along with the fabulous Dr. Emmy Brown, and we are here to Infuse your day with the vibrant energy of functional wellness. Dr. Emmy, are you feeling energized today? I am. I took my Bacopa, which is a nootropic for those of you who don't know. And I see Dr. Kate nodding. So we might even touch on that later. You I love good? it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'm going to have to get what you got. We are excited because we have a special guest who's ready to take us on a root cause journey towards better health. Get ready to be inspired educated, and invigorated as we dive into the world of functional medicine with the remarkable Dr. Kate Henry. Dr. Kate, head of medical education at Rupa Health and former director of functional medicine at Sonar today. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Okay. She's helped over 8,000 people thrive through her unique approach that combines therapy, coaching, natural medicine, and more. With a background in naturopathic medicine, biofeedback, and nutrition, she champions low-cost, effective solutions that make functional medicine accessible to all, which, amen to that. She's also no stranger to podcasts, as she hosts her very own podcast called The Root Cause Medicine Podcast, which I'm sure we'll chat about. I cannot wait to explore and learn from her, so let's welcome Dr. Kate to the pod. Thanks for having me, guys. Sure. So glad to have you, Dr. Kate. I'm going to get started. And I love everybody's story in terms of how we find our way into naturopathic medicine. So let's start there. How did you become interested in naturopathic medicine? Absolutely. So I was somebody who was searching. Um, in undergrad, I was on PubMed. Um, I had a lot of symptoms and I'd had a lot of great care through the traditional medical system for things like insomnia, stomach aches, depression and hadn't been able to fix them, even with some of the world's greatest experts. And so I was looking, and I was lucky enough to find a functional medicine practitioner um, who was able to just help me find my root causes. And there weren't many of them, actually. I had undiagnosed celiac disease, a few nutrient deficiencies, and within just a few days, my life completely changed. My mm -hmm. symptoms essentially disappeared, and I was hooked. I thought, okay, this can't just be my story. This has to be the story for other people too. And I want to learn how to find the root cause for other folks. Because what happened to me in the moment I found my root cause and healed is I was set free. I was set free from the daily struggle that I had been dealing with for 10 years. And I was able to use all that energy now to go help other people. And so my thought was, if I can do that for other people, what a ripple effect will that have? And so my functional medicine doctor said, if you want to learn how to do this in med school, go to naturopathic medical school and learn from the beginning how to use herbs, nutrition, physical medicine, counseling, along with pharmacology, minor surgery, and all the other tools that you'll get in primary care. And that's where my journey started. All the modalities, all the tools. Yeah. Okay. So what about focusing on mental health? Yeah. So that was what was key for me. I think... Um, before I got diagnosed with celiac disease, I had a stomach ache like I don't know, three times a day <laughs> because I was constantly eating gluten, like your cereal in the morning, your sandwich at lunch, pizza for dinner. And I just never felt well. And so as a result, I had a lot of problems with food where I would like really feel like afraid to eat. And I had some treatment at one point um, for an eating disorder, which like didn't really make sense, but it was kind of the only place my doctor could think to put me. Um, and as soon as those issues were gone, I thought, well, geez, that's so funny. I got labeled with what was a mental health disorder, but it was actually a gastrointestinal disorder. And I think that insight 
got me on the path of starting to investigate the physiological root causes of mental health disorders. And there are a lot of them. So for example, anxiety disorder and panic attacks are often can be linked with thyroid issues, with allergies, with histamine issues, and nutrient deficiencies. And we don't talk about that too much when it comes to, you know, traditional medicine. We might think, okay, you prescribe an SSRI or you tell someone to go to therapy. But the truth is, if you're looking at the other root cause issues, you can actually help someone heal much more quickly and even for good from those disorders. So that's where I really got addicted to that, like medical detective work within mental health. Um, And yeah, that's where that started for me. And so it became really important for me to empower folks to heal themselves with food. Because the other thing that I think most of us realize pretty quickly is we can talk about all these nutrients. We can talk about all these interventions and all this testing. At this point, most of these interventions are not covered by insurance, right? Supplements aren't. So when you think about how do I get my client to not have a, you know, 30 pills in their medicine cabinet and instead really get these nutrients from food, which is our birthright, so that it's cheaper. Yeah. And more effective. Like that is the other thing I started to do. Um, when I would meet with my clients is to have that really food as medicine based approach. Um, and so when you combine the two, uh, people started to get better really fast. And that was like the most fun part of clinical practice for me. Mm. So satisfying. Okay. And you touch on something really important. In the conventional model, we have a lot of silos. And so if we think it's mental health, we're just going to stay in that psychiatric care model. So I'm wondering that is an issue, obviously. But uh, what do you believe are some of the other most concerning limitations of today's conventional psychiatric model? Yeah. So it's funny, like I love psychiatrists, like almost without exception, I meet psychiatrists and like instantly they're so cool. Um, Because just for those of you who may not know, psychiatrists are MDs, like they go through medical training, they can choose any specialty they want. To choose psychiatry, I think makes you, you sometimes, this isn't always true, but a pretty special person because you In order to get someone who is anxious or depressed to feel safe enough with you, to trust you with their care, and to walk them through that journey, you have to be really good at listening. You have to be humble. You have to have an open heart. Mm -hmm. Part of what we're dealing with in, in America right now is we have a shortage of primary care and psychiatric care providers. So right now, half of the people in the U.S. live in a county without a single psychiatrist. 60%, and by the way, 50% of the people in the U.S. will have a mental health disorder at some point in their lives. Mm. 60% of people with a mental health disorder are getting their psychiatric medication from their primary care provider, probably because they can't even see a psychiatrist. And so for me, the issue isn't so much with psychiatric care as it is the fact that we don't have enough of it. So we need everybody else to upskill to be able to help clients in a holistic way. Mm-hmm. I worked with 80 therapists at Sonare and they were hungry for this information because what they would say is, Kate, I know something is wrong with this client because they are doing everything right. They're showing up to therapy every day or every week consistently. They're using all their skills and they are still depressed. And I can tell that their fatigue is impacting their mood, but I wasn't taught how to help them with that. And so my mission really is to highlight the nutritionists, right, right, the RDs, the therapists, the people who are already interacting with clients with mental health issues, but mm-hmm. may not know some of the very simple food as medicine based tools that yeah. we know are equally as effective as psychiatric medications at helping these folks. And so for me, it really is like we just need more of us and we need more of us who are educated about how to use food as medicine for mental health disorders. I love that we are talking about this because I could imagine, and I'm sure you know as a, as a practitioner, like this has been exacerbated since the pandemic. And I mean, there are so many opportunities. And I love that we're talking about nutrition. I want to tell you just briefly a personal story. I resonate so much with what you just said. About 11 years ago, my oldest daughter was diagnosed with type 1 and celiac, and it changed the way, obviously, we, we ate at home and how I cook for the family. And I resolved issues I had for 15 years, you know, in just a few weeks. So I just, I, I geek out about this. I'm so excited about this topic. Ooh, and I'm so glad you guys found her root cause and your root cause, it sounds like too. Yeah. That's amazing. I think we all like qualitatively, we know that this is worse since the pandemic. But there's actually been a few studies that really like put this in perspective for me, which I thought was interesting. 
pre-COVID, about 11% of U.S. adults reported active symptoms of anxiety or depression. Mm -hmm. In the pandemic, it was 40%. So when we think about a system that is already overtaxed, that already can't serve everyone, and then we just more than tripled the number of people who are reporting they have mental health issues. This is why I think just even the average everyday person in America understands that our mental health system is not keeping up. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It's, it's definitely gotten worse, but I think, and hopefully you guys are going to feel there's so much you can do. There is so much hope and you don't necessarily need your only person to be a psychiatrist in order to start to heal some of the symptoms of mental health disorders. We're going to talk about today how a nutrition doc, how a functional medicine doc can help you. Right. You touch on so many things in terms of the, the simple tools. So I'm wondering, um, Dr. Kate, what's the top nutrient deficiency in the United States and why does it matter for mental health? Just starting Um, really simply. I love this topic. Yeah. So everybody at home, I want you to actually guess and just like think in your mind, what do you think the top nutrient deficiency in the U.S. is? Most people say vitamin D or B12. Mm -hmm. And those are definitely in the top 10, according to the NHANES study, which is a, a national study that we perform every few years as a country to survey our population. It's a partnership with the NIH and the CDC um, to look at, you know, what is our what is our population suffering from? The number one nutrient deficiency in the U.S. in the last NHANES study was vitamin B6, which most people haven't like really heard that much about. However, you need vitamin B6 to make every single one of your neurotransmitters, serotonin, mm-hmm. dopamine, and GABA. Now there's way more neurotransmitters than this, but when we when we sort of talk colloquially about mental health, we really usually are talking about these three neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, and GABA. You need B6 for all of these. And so as we're talking about the fact that like we are the most depressed and anxious cohort in US history, um, and we also happen to have the highest levels of B6 deficiency in our history, like it makes sense. And part of that is because the number one food source of B6 is garbanzo beans. And the number two source is beef liver. (laughs) And you'd have to eat like a cup and a half of garbanzo beans a day to get enough B6 if you don't eat beef liver, which like most of my clients don't. A lot of my like anybody who's 80 or older may still eat some beef liver or remember like their parents making them eat that. Dr. Emmy is nodding. Do you do you eat beef liver? Do you know? Well, it can be cultural, not beef liver, but more so chicken liver. Mm -hmm. So in the Jewish cooking culture, that is going to be more traditional and and not as um, taboo, if you will. But of course, the generations will be more familiar. Well, and this is the thing. So in the 19 between like the 1950s and the 1970s, we really started to industrialize our food supply. So we moved away from a lot of our traditional ways of eating, which did include things like organ meats. Organ meats are very concentrated sources of nutrients because we store, as mammals, we store nutrients in our organ. And so as a society, as we've moved away from eating more of those things, we've become more and more nutrient deficient. You can also consider that our soils are more nutrient. There's a lot of factors. Um, But many people, when they find out beef liver is the top source of like most fat soluble nutrients and many B vitamins, so vitamins A, D, E, K, tons of B, they go, oh, that's why my grandmother was trying to force feed me liver all the time. Right. They Very knew. Well. <laughs> yeah. well, look, we didn't have supplements until like the 60s. Right. So yeah. how else would you have gotten that? And throughout all, our entire evolution as a species, we had to rely on food. We didn't have supplements. So you have to start to think, well, what were humans eating that got them enough of these nutrients? So this is where the science of like food and nutrients starts to get really cool for folks because they go, it, it makes sense. Right. They go like, oh, well, I don't eat any of those foods ever. I don't That's supplement that nutrient. nutrient. Right. And we actually, in the, at Sonare, we would run a nutrient analysis for folks of their diet. So we would go through a couple days of their diet and put it in chronometer, which is like the closest thing I think most people know about is my fitness pal, which will oh not, we were, we were looking at macros, but not as closely as we were looking at micros. And people would start to see, whoa, I'm only getting 10% of the vitamin B6 I need in a day, every day. And I've probably been doing that for 10 years. Oh, perhaps this is something I want to consider correcting as I go on my journey to optimize my neurotransmitter production and mood. Right. Uh, and I got yeah. to know, Dr. Kate, how do, what's the best way to supplement that uh, organ meat 
do you want i mean there are freeze-dried supplements now we can go to a a trustworthy butcher of course i mean there's even ground beef mixed with heart and liver i've heard of this i've heard of the brand i have not been able to find it um but what do you like and also i'm wondering about garbanzos it's really hard to eat you know more than just a little bit because it's so filling but now we have bonds of pasta that's made out of chickpeas and that's super popular so how do we tackle this that's exa- exactly what you just said. So the process that we used at Sonare is to identify the, the deficiencies, teach people what the top sources were, and then work with them to figure out what's actually doable. So if someone is willing to do organ meat or mix it in with ground beef and put it in their taco, amazing. Most people aren't. Yeah, at least at first. And a lot of times what we'll say to folks is like, you don't have to change your diet overnight. That's, that is what supplements are for. Mm -hmm. including gummy supplements or liquid supplements. Like there are a lot of really high quality supplements that you can use to like just start to deliver someone their nutrients that they're deficient in very quickly. And then over time, they would work with our RDs and our coaches to begin to integrate those foods enough into their diet where they start to become replete. So it was sort of like, you know, it's really hard to cook a four course meal three times a week. So you have enough to like take to work and stuff when your brain isn't working because you don't have enough B6. So in my mind, I'm like, let's get you enough B6, even if you're eating six gummies a day, as long as you brush your teeth. And like, and then we worry about that. Um, But there's so many beautiful, nutritious ways. And thinking about that nutrition by addition. So with our clients, I think they usually felt really relieved because what they thought I was going to do when they came in was say, stop drinking, stop eating snacks, Stop eating gluten, stop eating dairy, stop eating eggs, stop eating lectins, like whatever they had heard about already online, right? Mm -hmm. And instead, what we were saying is, wow, look how nutrient deficient your diet is or your blood work is. Let's let's have you learn to add these nutrient-rich foods back in in a way that's really tasty and yummy. Um, My favorite way to sneak beans into someone's diet is through brownies. So (laughs) you can like, yeah, everyone's nodding, yeah. yeah. I have an amazing cookie recipe with chickpeas that is, um, it's just so good. Um, Put that in the show notes. Absolutely share it. I need it. Because that's, I think we all have enough rules around food. Um, And particularly if someone's educated in functional nutrition at all, or they've listened to any podcast at all, they're generally like, they've already got enough restrictions and they probably aren't eating cookies. So when you can add something like that back in and it's nourishing them, win-win. And the kids will eat it too. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love it. Yeah. After we're off, we'll have to swap recipes. I feel like we all have some good ones, but I digress. Um, I do want to shift gears a little bit. Um, I know in preparing for the podcast, I read that you wrote about being able to cure panic attacks, which I am fascinated by. I'm dying to know the secret. So elaborate sort of the the strategies and methods you employ for this debilitating debilitating condition. Yeah, it's funny. It sounds like I must be like full of hubris or something to say that, but I wouldn't say it if I hadn't seen it work like dozens and dozens and dozens of times. So there's four major root cause categories for anxiety disorders in general, as we know right now, right? Oxidative stress or an imbalance of oxidative stress to antioxidant capacity nutrient deficiencies, hormone imbalances, and immune dysfunction. With panic attacks, generally one of two things would work to help clients immediately. The first was inositol. Inositol is a supplement that we use typically for cycling patients, so somebody who's in a female body who has PCOS because it helps to sensitize the ovaries to insulin. So inositol, it's funny, we used to think of it as the B vitamin, we have reclassified it in nutrition as a glucose isomer. I will let the PhDs in nutrition debate like what it actually is. But what we know is it's a nutrient with no toxic dose and almost no side effects. And it really helps people to manage their blood sugar, to metabolize their hormones because it helps with um, liver detoxification. And so acutely, right when someone would come in, if they were being debilitated by panic attacks, we would put inositol in their water all throughout the day, powder. And then they could take some acutely if they felt like they were about to get a panic attack. And without fail, it would work to prevent it, with one exception. If the, if the hyperventilation episode was being caused by an anaphylactic allergy or, or a food reaction, that's the only case where it wouldn't work. And then we would address that. Um, so inositol, is, it's interesting. There was a really incredible study that was done comparing it to an SSRI head-to-head 
for treatment of anxiety disorders. And inositol was better. They actually studied it up to 18 grams a day and it didn't have any side effects. And 18 grams a day is a very large dose. You can see that Dr. Emmy's eyebrows are going up. It's like, wow, that's a lot. I would use like one to two grams um, throughout the day. The only thing that would ever happen is sometimes people would get like a little bit of like loose stool if they got up to the really high doses. And especially if they had any like um, SIBO or dysbiosis in their gut, they tended to be more sensitive to that glucose isomer sugar type. Um, so inositol, my favorite supplement. Um, any psychiatrist who's listening, anybody dealing with folks with panic disorder should investigate that and really consider it as part of your toolkit for helping your clients. Um, the other thing is looking at the interaction between like histamine and food reactions and your patient's what's called ventilatory threshold. So almost always an aspect of panic attacks is hyperventilation. So, and that has to do with the concentration of oxygen and, and CO2 in your blood. And People feel like they're not getting enough air usually, right? That's kind of part of a panic attack is you feel like you can't breathe. But if you put a pulse ox on them, you can see that their O2 sat is 100. Like they have more than enough oxygen and yet they're breathing like they don't. And so this is why breathing techniques are so effective for helping folks manage panic. But a histamine reaction changes your ventilatory threshold. So if you are allergic to eggs and you eat eggs, and you're having a histamine reaction, not only do you get a huge adrenaline release, which is going to make you feel anxious, um, your ventilatory threshold changes. And so you're more likely to hyperventilate. And so I would find often people had an IgE allergy. And using Vibrant's panel, actually, um, people had an IgE allergy that we hadn't even picked up on to eggs. And just because like they weren't getting rashes and their throat wasn't swelling up enough to land them in the ER, nobody had caught it yet. And so when we would take out whatever they were reacting to, they would get better. So those were the two main things. Now, we were always working with folks to optimize their diet and make sure it was nutrient replete. So we can't take that out of the equation because my clients who heal their panic attacks were also doing that. Mm -hmm. But like, I think inositol is the best kept secret that I just don't want to be a secret anymore. Like anybody with panic disorder needs to be talking to their functional medicine doctor about it. Awesome. I wrote that down. That's great. Well, I'm assuming you Don't probably worry. have a case study to share. Do you, does, oh. Is there one top of mind that you can share with us? Yeah. it's So we. I'll give you guys the link. And, and guys at home, if you're thinking this sounds too good to be true, or yeah, maybe that works for other people, but it definitely won't work for someone like me, I would challenge you to go read this because I think you'll recognize a lot of yourself in some of the stories that I've published. And this is why we publish these stories. Like, this was me up at like 11 o'clock at night typing up someone's story. Like usually I was collaborating with the client. So it was kind of fun. Um, and because what I would, what I always said to them is, you know, what do you wish? Cause usually these folks were searching online anyway for months before they came to see me, they were looking for answers. So I would say, how can we write up your story in a way where like the you six months ago would have found it mm -hmm. and maybe could have brought this to their primary care and, and healed. And so I'm so grateful to one of my clients. Um, Mary is the name we used for her um, for doing this with me. And so we wrote up Mary's story. Um, Mary was in her young 20s and couldn't drive, couldn't go to school, couldn't see her friends because every time she would get in the car, she'd have a panic attack. And it was like really debilitating her. And this was like, Mary, I love this client. Like she, so smart, so friendly, just like a heart full of joy and purpose and like wanted to be a medical professional and help folks and was being completely sidelined by this thing that she felt like she had no control over. She'd been to every therapist, had used every tool and still could not stop this. And so we did. Within a month, her panic attacks were gone. Hmm. She's been panic attack free for over a year and a half. Wow. And this is like the level of hope I want folks at home to feel is like when I tell you like we can stop this, I mean it and there's proof. Um, so a lot of what we did for her, yes, obviously, food allergy and sensitivity testing, inositol for sure. She also, like many people with anxiety disorder, had a diet that was deficient in most antioxidants. So a lot of B vitamins, vitamins A, D, E, K, C. And so we started to replete her with those. Um, we also like, it's interesting, it came back, she had like some elevated ANA and um, signs of hyperthyroidism. So we actually sent her to endocrinology and rheumatology but we've got a six week wait for those specialties in our area. So before she even got there, we fixed her. 
Wow. And then by the, unfortunately, by the time she got there, they were like, you're fine. You're healthy. Why are you here? You know, but I'm like, whatever. At least they're on your team if we ever need them. Um, but we did that. And then she had migraines as well. So we gave her a supplement that had um, appropriate uh, pharmaceutical grade doses of fever, feed, butter, burr, magnesium, CoQ10, riboflavin, and magnesium. Um, and her migraines also disappeared during this time. She had insomnia. We replaced her with GABA and B6. Insomnia resolved. Um, we gave her omega-3s, which... One of my favorite studies in the whole wide world, guys, um, is this study where like head to head, it was randomized placebo controlled trial. They did three grams of omega-3s per day for three months versus placebo. And at the end of that study, the people who took omega-3s experienced a 50% reduction in anxiety and anger compared wow. to the people who took placebo, right? That's crazy. Isn't that funny? Because like here we, I think so many people think, Anger is like purely psychological. I'll talk to my psychologist about it if I'm going to fix it. And it's like, well, it could be an omega-3 deficiency or a lack of antioxidants because omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory. Maybe you're just inflamed. Um, so this is what I'm saying. Like when I talk to RDs, I get so excited because I like show up to a conference with RDs and I'm like, I start always start out and I say, how many of you would say you do mental health care? Take the counseling part out of what you do. How many people would say you are mental health care providers? Nobody raises their hand. And for an hour, I'm like, here's a study that omega-3s are equally as effective as SSRIs. Here's another study about magnesium <laughs> being better than the leading anti-anxiety drug. And they're like, oh my God, you know? And, and at the end, I'm like, okay, now how many of, of you would say you do mental health care? And everybody raises their hand because they realize that nutrients are equally as effective as pharmaceuticals and they do nutrition. And I mm. think that's the, that's the sort of like, that's what I want our, our nutritionists and our functional medicine doctors. I want them to feel that certainty and that like pride and to be armed with the tools and information they need to really confidently stand up and say like, we are equipped to be part of this mental health care response to the mental health care crisis in America. And so this information is what they need mm. to do that. That's crazy. And I was going to ask the question, I think you just answered it, but uh, the nutrient that has the ability to address anger, is that the omega threes that you're talking about? Oh, yeah. It always surprises people. And so, guys, top sources of omega-3s in the diet are flaxseed, uh, chia seed, and salmon, or a fish oil supplement. And so, most, I don't know, Dr. Hemi, how, how many people in your practice were eating salmon, chia seeds, or flaxseeds at least every day? Right. No one. Almost none. No, no one. one. Yeah. I mean, I have chia seeds in my chia seed pudding right next to me. But that's something I just started doing. <laughs> and, yes. You know, you wax and you wane. Things come and go. That's very common. Um, but we really need to get the word out on those. I mean, people know about the cold water fish, like salmon, a couple times a week. It's still not enough. It's And I see it on the, the micronutrient test. The EPA, even if the DHA and the total omega-3s are within normal limits or close to average, the EPA is always low normal. Almost always, unless somebody is really trying to get that up. Yeah. So, yep. I've Which we it. know. It's interesting. There's a paper. Um, I'll link it for you guys so you can put it in the show notes. But it's um, it's basically the shorthand of the title is Biomarkers of Depression and Suicidality in People with PTSD and Depression. And it was sponsored by the NIH. Like it was NIH funded. Remarkable study talking about how somebody can walk in our clinic and I have to ask, I don't even have to ask them any questions. I just have to look at their blood and I can tell how depressed they'll be. That is how granular we're getting right now. And that was published in journals of psychiatry, right? So what, what we're saying, this like viewpoint we've got now, everybody at home, what Dr. Emmy just said is she looks at people's omega-3s in their blood, right? She's looking for that. We're supposed to be doing that in mental health care. Because we know, for example, the people with severe mental health issues have low levels of omega-3s, low levels of antioxidant nutrients that you've already heard me talk about, Bs, A, D, E, K, zinc is a, another antioxidant nutrient, and very high levels of inflammation. And when we correct that, like giving somebody omega-3s for anxiety and anger, they get better a lot of times, if that's their root cause, mm -hmm. right? And so what we have right now is I think uh, we're doing a really great job of starting to push this education. So it's showing up in journals. Um, it's not easy to get this type of study funded, as you guys can imagine, because you cannot patent a nutrient. So 
like nobody's going to make money on this omega-3 study per se, because you can't have a pharmaceutical grade omega-3. You could, but like you can't keep the patent on it. So somebody else is going to steal it immediately and make all the money. And so we're not getting that level of investment in this type of research. And it's mm. not like a conspiracy and it's not intentional. It's just like the way capitalism and our society works right now. And so we are, though, seeing these studies start to show up. And what I notice is the average psychiatrist will go like, oh, cool, interesting. It's one thing they learn out of the like 1,000 things they've got to learn every year. And like they may start to prescribe omega-3s, but they're not entirely clear like how they would even check it in the blood. And so you guys at Vibrant have a nutrient panel that is really useful for this. Do you want to tell folks like what's included in that? I'm glad you asked, Dr. Kate, because we're looking at intracellular values in addition to serum values. So we can see, is this nutrient really getting inside the cell where it needs to function? Um, so I think that's extremely valuable. You can monitor patients using the micronutrient test. It's, it's one of many. And I'm wondering, what else do you like to use in terms of functional medicine tests? And we can focus on testing um, as much as we like. But I know there's some more clinical based tools that you use, too. I was watching a podcast of yours. You talked about the brain health assessment, um, AD data point nutrient evaluation. I think you touched on that earlier in terms of that software, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah. micronutrients is just one of many. It totally is. The tools are so helpful, I think, in a couple things. One, doing the medical detective work. And two, we, we would use questionnaires like the brain health assessment to really begin to take a more clinical look at the symptoms someone was having. So much of what people do with mental health is that they, they turn it into this like thing about willpower or personality. Um, or circumstance or psychology. And while there may be components of that and whatever they're dealing with, like that is not my experience. Um, and so they're not coming in saying, hey, Kate, I must be really inflamed because I'm angry. <laughs> they're saying like, I'm angry and I'm in therapy and, you know, it's my fault and it's because of my parents. And like, we are meaning making <sighs> beings as humans. And so we come up with stories that like may make sense. But when you can sit someone down and show them their dietary analysis, you don't get enough omega-3s, vitamin D, or thiamine. Their blood. Okay, not only do you not eat enough, we now know in your blood there's not enough or in your cells there's not enough. And you have a brain type pattern that really is showing us that you have a lot of rumination, right? Like you're reporting a lot of those symptoms. Let's see if we can use these nutrients to fix that. And then we're going to track that symptom over time. So we're going to have you do all these again, whether it's the brain health assessment or repeat testing. And then their experience is, oh, whoa, there really is a, a biochemical part of this that is not based on my willpower or my personality. It's not about me. It's literally like, do I have enough of this nutrient or not? The shame just like falls away. Mm. Um, and that's part of what's so healing. And that's part of what can really be in the way for folks of seeking help because we think it's our fault. Yeah. Right? We, we get stuck there. And you can have the best therapist in the world working with you on your shame issues if you do not have enough iron in your blood to deliver oxygen to your brain, it's not going to be very effective, yeah. right? Like, That's so this so profound. Is, <laughs> yes, yes. And this is where like, so part of what we were doing at Sonare before I, I left to come to Rupa, and I'm still in really close contact with them there, is that we were starting to train our therapists in how to recognize signs of nutrient deficiency mm -hmm. because they were asking, right? Because they would go like, Kate, this person has rashes all over them and they have this autoimmune disorder and they have stomach issues. Could that possibly be related to their depression? And like for those of us on this call, we're already like, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Like, obviously, <laughs> they probably are inflamed and have nutrient deficiency. Their hormones may be out of whack. We got to look at their sleep. Um, and so what would happen is because I was working at Scenario, it was very easy for these therapists to send to me because I was doing functional medicine, what started to happen in the community was their friends who were therapists didn't have a functional medicine doctor on staff. And they would call in and say, what do I do for this client? And I would say, well, send them to their primary care. You know, I recommend that based on what you're telling me about them, you might want to consider, you know, like letting the primary care know you can write a note to the primary care and say, hey, my client's having these symptoms. I really encourage them to follow up with you. You know, like uh, I've mentioned to them that, you know, based on my training that I've gotten you know, through functional medicine at my practice, they might want to consider X, Y, Z. Um, 
what would happen is it would be a three month wait for the client to get in to their primary. Mm. And so they really like didn't have a way to help their client and they might only be working with them for 12 weeks. A lot of what we did was like partial hospitalization or IOP. So again, we have these people who really want to help and we're sort of like hitting that block on, with our healthcare system. And so what I was really happy we could do at Sonare was we had like a lab shop. So we basically had an asynchronous program and it was called like eat right for your brain type and eat right for your sleep and eat right for your hormones. And people could go in and order a test panel through Rupa Lab Shops. They could just click a button, get their test, go along with the asynchronous course, start to understand why all this mattered for their health. So that by the time they had their appointment, they were armed with the information and ready to rock and roll. And to me, that's where we've got to start to move as a society um, is really empowering people with the tools that they need to take charge of their own health care and then identify and really connect with the providers who can help them. Because if, you know, what do you do in that three month wait? You might have the perfect person, but if you can't see them for 12 weeks, like you might be in a crisis, like you may really need help. So we need to be able to help folks quickly. Yeah. And that's so valuable to talk about what can we do in the interim when people are trying to get into specialists and it really takes a team and touching on, again, just really simple things you mentioned well, what about iron deficiency? But I've heard you cite research, Dr. Kate, that shows only 500 milligrams of vitamin C once a day for two weeks reduce anxiety. And that blew me away because I tend to think, wow, I need a lot more vitamin C if I'm taking it for whenever, you know, <laughs> uh, cold and flu season or just feeling run down. And um, but 500 milligrams once a day, that that really blew me away. Isn't that crazy? And like, that's half Not of a... That's half of an emergency packet, <laughs> truthfully, right? Or like a cup of orange juice and like a red pepper. You know, it's, it's not hard. Money, yeah. It's not, yeah, it's not hard. Like, and and it works. That's the exciting thing for me is when you can like, you see a study that would, you reading it, if you just substituted the word vitamin C for Wellbutrin, you'd be like, oh, wow, this is really profound. This is amazing. Look how well, you know, organized this, this trial is. And wow, I'm really, it's really compelling. It's done in the same way for a lot of these nutrients. We have really amazing evidence for it um, in, the, in the same way we would study a drug. So yeah, absolutely. I love this. I'm feverishly writing notes. I, I got to go back and check my supplement packs, make sure I got all of this. <laughs> well, what's interesting is um, a multivitamin Actually, we'll do a lot of this. So if you're at home thinking, are you serious? Do I have to start eating beef liver? <laughs> no, take heart, everyone. Like you, you, if you want to, great, please do it. Um, with the guidance of an RD and talk to your primary care, you actually can get too many of these nutrients, and particularly the fat soluble ones, A, D, E, K. Be careful with those. Invest the money and time in at least one visit with someone who can check your labs, Look at the other medications you're taking because nutrients can interact with medications um, and, you know, health conditions, family history, all that, and get them to advise you about what you need. Um, but even a, a multivitamin can significantly decrease anxiety and perceived stress. And that's a simple once a day thing. And guys, yeah. they make some pretty delicious multi gummies these days. <laughs> Let's switch gears to ADHD because um, I know that's been a focus of your career. Uh, a recent analysis from health records, uh, a health records company, Epic, found that the incidence of ADHD in their database tripled from 2010 to 2023. That's an increase of 200 percent in just 12 years. So my question's two part for you. One, what, in your opinion, is really going on here? And two, could you share some of your favorite approaches um, that have some promising results? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. What's going on? What I will say is. Because I'm not like an anthropologist or an epidemiologist, like I may not, I don't, I'm not going to trick anybody at home into thinking I like know for sure. Yeah. Um, but I will tell you like what, what my gut is based on my clinical experience. Um, the first is I think we're getting a lot better at recognizing ADHD um, in people who are not just young boys. Um, for a long time, our diagnostic criteria really focused on the hyperactivity portion of ADHD and we missed a lot of females with ADHD. Um, I would say a lot of my like teenage and older clients who were in female bodies came in to see me because they had just been diagnosed with ADHD for the first time. And 
they didn't get diagnosed because they weren't causing classroom behavioral issues. So the teacher wasn't calling home saying, you better put this kid on meds if you want them in my class. And so nobody picked up on it. Instead, what happened to them is they were inattentive. So they weren't paying attention or they're really what happens with ADHD is you're paying attention to too many things at once. It shouldn't be called attention deficit. It should, it should mm-hmm. be called attention access because I love they're- I say that. Your clarification, client, important your clarification. Yeah, the client with ADHD is sitting here. They're trying to listen to their teacher. A pen drops in the corner. They're thinking about what their friend said to them at lunch. They're hot. They're paying attention to that. And so they're not able to focus on the material enough to like ingrain it or they're taking the test and it takes them longer because they're getting so distracted. And so, so many of my female clients, like you might have sailed through elementary and middle school, but really started to struggle when the attention demands of their material increased and they were not able to keep up. And instead, what they got labeled with was you're lazy, you're disorganized, you're you don't care you're not paying attention, or you're just not very smart. And so they did not get diagnosed until older adulthood when maybe their kid got diagnosed and their male partner didn't have ADHD. And so the psychiatrist might have started to encourage them to consider whether or not they did. Um, so I think, long story short, I think, I think we're getting better at recognizing the signs of ADHD. Mm-hmm. And this is why we're seeing an increase in diagnoses. Um, I think the other reason is, you know, a lot of people who would come see me, particularly on the East Coast, if you see a naturopathic doctor on the East Coast, like you want natural interventions. <laughs> like that doesn't happen by accident. You don't just wander in my office, you know, and like feel surprised that I have like herbs and nutrition in my toolkit <laughs> working for me usually. So my my clients would come in and say like, fix my kid. They have ADHD, but I don't want them on meds. We, we put them on meds. They turned into a zombie. Help. Yeah. And so part... We would talk about all the nutrients and, and things, which we're going to talk about in a second, and the herbs. But part of the conversation with those parents would be, I want you to start to think about your kid as just being a natural athlete. And they need to have a sport. Period. All, mm-hmm. Every day for the rest of their lives. Like, if you want them to have enough blood flow to their frontal lobe for them to focus, they need to be moving consistently. We know this. Exercise is an incredibly interven- incredibly effective intervention for kids with ADHD and adults. Um, And it's not a drug. And so it really only has side benefits and no side effects. Like the side benefits are your cardiovascular system is also healthy and like you're fit and you're protected from insulin resistance. Like you're tired enough to sleep at night because sleep is another huge problem for kids with ADHD and people with ADHD. So um, what part of what we lack in society is adequate movement. And so we stick these kids in seats all day. We don't let them move. Um, we feed them like really high sugar meals. Maybe they, we don't make sure they have protein in the morning and then we expect them to pay attention. And like, that's just not evolutionarily what we're meant to do. We're meant to move. So when you move, you bring blood flow to your frontal lobe and your frontal lobe is that part of your brain right behind your forehead, guys, for those of you who are listening at home who may not be familiar with neuroanatomy, it's that part of your brain right behind your forehead that helps you focus. It helps you pay attention, do future planning. So it helps you do things like recognize that your car registration is going to expire in three months. So like, maybe you should take care of that, you know, and then like actually take care of it. Um, mm-hmm. It helps keep in thoughts that shouldn't get out. Like, you know, like really like inhibit inappropriate behaviors and like not say hurtful things to your friends or, you know, things that you might regret or that a lot of my female clients who are adults would come in and be like, I don't verbal vomit anymore. It's so great now that I'm on my Bacopa or, you know, tyrosine. Like, <laughs> I'm able to like, yeah, yeah, moderate. Um, so I think we have a movement deficient society. Um, our society is not consuming enough protein and we consume a lot of simple sugars. And part of what that does is because we make dopamine and adrenaline from amino acids, it sets us up to not give our kids enough dopamine and adrenaline, which is what helps increase uh, focus and drive blood flow to the frontal lobe. So a lot of these like meds that you hear of for ADHD, the stimulant meds, they work by preventing your body from really getting rid of dopamine and adrenaline as efficiently as it normally does. And so it tricks your brain basically into thinking you have more than you do. Well, why don't we just give your brain enough to begin with, right? So rule for my ADHD folks was like 30 grams of protein in the morning if they were adults, like 
get your protein in, get some movement in. So 30 grams of protein, 30 minutes of movement. And would that happen every day? No, but they might get 10 minutes of movement. Um, and really what we were starting to have them check in with is like, how do you feel? And how is your focus the rest of the day? And so people would start to experience a lot of improvement with those things. Another fascinating study, and you guys can cut me off after this. I know I'm talking a lot, um, <laughs> is that we there was a fascinating study recently where they had a bunch of kids who were prescribed stimulant medications. They had ADHD. And they had they made both sets of kids wait eight weeks. The kids who got zinc supplementation for eight weeks prior to taking stimulant meds required 37% less stimulant medication than the kids who do not did not get zinc before mm -hmm. starting the meds. Wow. And that is a really powerful tool for a parent out there to have who's worried about side effects for their kid with ADHD mm -hmm. medication is you can do both. And in fact, when you do both, your kid will have less side effects, require less medication and get mm -hmm. it. And, and it was more effective. So we're always encouraging our parents like a lot of people come in and they have a lot of judgments. Um, they're scared of medications for their kid and so they've been withholding them, which unfortunately usually means their kid hasn't been having their disability treated adequately yeah. for a long enough time. Um, and so we start to educate our clients about like, you get to use it all. Let's build you a really big toolkit, including exercise, nutrition, herbs. And it's not what is best. It's when is best. So we're going to start with nutrition and exercise because the, the when for those is always right now. Like it's usually, unless your kid has like a broken leg, it's usually a good idea to do those things. Um, and then we're going to think about when for medication. You know, at what point would you consider trying it? Or do you just use it for weekdays? Do you use it for school days where your kid doesn't get to move? Like do you use it only on Tuesdays because they don't have soccer practice on Tuesdays? Um, because along with the increase in diagnosis, I think there's been a bit of a backlash from the professional community saying like ADHD is overdiagnosed. And there's still people out there who think ADHD is not real, which blows my mind. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like, you clearly haven't spent time with people who have it or you'd believe it. Um, but like, we need to empower people to recognize that like, this is a disorder that when untreated costs the average person with ADHD $15,000 a year between like, lost days of work, lost opportunities, excess medical visits, accidents. With kids with ADHD, when it's under-medicated, they have a lot of social problems usually. Um, and so mm -hmm. it costs them friends, costs them well-being. And so we have to start treating it for these folks. And so I'm frankly happy it's being diagnosed at a higher rate, but want people to know they have a ton of options. It's not just meds. Yeah. I love how you speak about marrying, you know, traditional and holistic, you know, modalities, because I think that's really important for some parents that really are lost or, or confused or overwhelmed. So thank you for pointing that out. Right. Yeah, I agree. And that integrative approach is something we don't want to have any shame about and leads me to my next question, which is what are some top nutraceutical, I'm thinking 5-HTP or herb drug interactions you want practitioners to be aware of because we want to use these things safely? Together. Oh, that's a great, that's a great point. So there's actually a really beautiful tool um, that's still like being developed, but it's called Mitovin. Have you guys heard of it? No. Oh my God. Okay. M-Y-T-A-B-I-N.com. Okay. Go, make sure you're using it, folks at home. Um, you type in the nutrient and I forget what university this is being compiled by. Like there's a group of PhDs who are doing this information. Um, and it will tell you like what nutrient deficiencies are associated with that medication. So for example, most SSRIs are associated with, an, with a decreased serum level of melatonin over time. And biochemically, that makes sense because you make serotonin from melatonin, or you make melatonin from serotonin. So if you're blocking the reuptake of serotonin and preventing its transformation, you're going to have issues with melatonin. Additionally, if you don't have enough serotonin in the first place, which is why you need SSRIs, you can't possibly be making enough melatonin. So little things like that where you can start to understand, you know, like what, what could interact with this or what could this medication like be doing in my biochemistry. And so, again, not a reason to not take it, but right. if you know, hey, this, could, this is going to increase my need for melatonin, maybe you start doing a little melatonin gummy at night and then you get ahead of that. So that way you do get to use the medication and you don't get the side effects. 
Um, other interactions, 5-HTP St. John's were great point, Dr. Emmy, um, that Im influences the way your liver metabolizes these drugs. Um, and I never have anybody taking pharmaceutical medications on those herbs. Um, another great example, like statins will deplete CoQ10. So you have to make sure that you're taking CoQ10 if you're taking a statin. Um, with I, I actually really didn't use a lot of herbs in my practice because frequently I would see clients who were on four plus psychiatric medications when they would come into my office. Mm -hmm. Herbs are medicines, y'all, at home. If you do not know, like they are the original <laughs> pharmaceuticals. In fact, like aspirin is made from willow tree bark. Like before we had pharmaceuticals, we had herbs. And now we like refine them and we put them in pills. But like many of our medications are made from plant medicine. So you, you must be careful with them. You have to work with either like an herbalist or a naturopathic doctor or a functional medicine doctor if you're going to use herbs along with medications because it can be very dangerous for you. Even something as simple as like, Drinking grapefruit juice with some of your medication can interfere with the way that medication is broken down and cause it to build up in your system, hmm. which if it's a seizure medication or a blood thinner is not a good thing. So always a good idea to check those interactions. Um, some of the safer herbs that are generally okay to take, if you, even if you're on pharmaceutical meds, and always run this by your provider, guys. But like think about food-grade herbs. So like chamomile tea. You know, like something you could buy in the grocery store that does and not come in. And think of chamomile. Yeah. And very calming and effective for helping kids with ADHD sleep. Hmm. So we know that things like ashwagandha, valerian, which is a little bit more of a heavy hitting herb. Don't take that if you guys are taking any sort of sedative medication. Um, hmm. But ashwagandha, valerian, um, chamomile, lemon balm. Um, are really effective for helping kiddos with ADHD to calm down. They're really great things to have your kid take at night. Um, for you to take at night if you're someone with ADHD who has a problem with sleep onset or anxiety. Um, so yeah, but honestly, most of what we did in my clinic was nutrients because nutrients have a far less likelihood to interact with medications than herbs for the most part. And so that's why we would always go back to food because for the most part, food is safe. For yeah. the most part, people can do food. So when you start there, you do the safest intervention first. You just shared so many pearls here. I love it. Um, so apart from nutrition, oh, and we talked about the herbal aspect too, is there any other practical strategies that you could share with the listeners on, you know, how to support mental health? Oh, yeah. Okay. So guys, if you don't have access to a functional medicine doctor, which like you might, you should check first before <laughs> you assume that you don't. So like, Use the IFM tool. Um, look for a naturopathic doctor through the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians. Look for an RD who is functional medicine certified or even some chiropractors are certified in functional medicine. Like, do you guys have a, a provider portal with Vibrant? We're, we're actually working on that on the new website where patients that are looking for one, they, they can fill out a form and we kind of direct them to, to the right Amazing. person. Amazing. Yeah. In the meantime, somebody could probably contact your sales team. And because you guys know all the doctors in the area, you might even be able to help them. Um, but chances are there's somebody in your area or providing telehealth in your state who does this type of medicine. And so my first recommendation is always find that person and start to work with them. Um, if you don't have access to that, build your team. So your primary care doctor can help with identifying a lot of these nutrient deficiencies. Like they can run a CBC and find anemia, right? Even if they're not willing to run specific nutrients, the basic blood work you get there every year and the physical may give them clues about your mental health root cause. Start there, find an RD, um, maybe find like a physical therapist if you aren't able to move because you're injured and definitely a therapist and start to build that team. And then if at that point you're not getting better, that's where you want to find someone to help you do the root cause. So uh, root cause workup. So we have, I'm sure Vibrant has tons of blogs. Um, we have the case studies. We have a ton of write-ups on like what nutrients matter in mental health care. You've heard us mention a bunch of them on this podcast. You could start with checking those. And if you don't have an eating disorder and you're not bothered by tracking your nutrients, you could use a software like Chronometer. It comes in a free app or MyFitnessPal to start to look at your diet and identify, do you have deficiencies in your diet of these nutrients we've talked about? Omega-3, vitamin D, B vitamins, you know, vitamin C. And if you do, just start to correct them. You w work with a nutrition specialist. Um, those would be my immediate things. And then the second thing is like, if you do not have a medical degree, 
or a therapy degree, you are actually not qualified to figure out what your root cause is. Mm-hmm. And that should be a relief to you. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I like so that. like, you know what I mean? Like You're so many times people come to my, yeah, would come off and be like, oh, this is totally my fault. I'm just lazy. And I'm like, actually, what training do you have? <laughs> um like why don't you let me see if you're vitamin deficient you know like that should be a relief stop trying to do it yourself don't keep yourself stuck by assuming it's your fault get your butt in the chair in front of a medical professional who does this for a living yeah. and ask them what they think and ask them to help you because that was the key for me it was the key for many of my clients that set them free and you deserve that same freedom totally invest in yourself is what comes to mind when you say that at your case yeah. In all ways, not just financially, but the time, the effort, and things that might sound like chores in terms of the lifestyle and the dietary modification. I know you do a great job making those things a lot easier. I've heard you talk about that on recipes and such, but still, eventually, they'll become this almost like a gift. Is at least that's how I feel. Once you start to really learn to love these things and see how much better you feel, it goes from feeling like a chore maybe you know at first to then feeling like such a gift so invest in yourself is what I really want to say with that so we've learned so much Dr. Kate and before we let you go I you're obviously extremely passionate you're obviously a highly skilled clinician um, and you love clinical practice but you recently stepped back from one-to-one patient care and now you work at Rupa Health full-time I'd love to know why oh my gosh yes So what broke my heart in clinical practice was realizing it took people years to find me and realizing that even though we have a ton of incredibly trained clinicians who are great at functional medicine, they either didn't know it well enough to advertise it or didn't feel confident enough saying that they could treat mental health disorders for patients to then like find that on their website. And so what I started to realize is we, we need more of us. And the best way that I can make sure that there are more of us responding to this mental health crisis is to teach people, to empower them, and to then help them reach the clients who are looking for them. So Rupa Health gave me that opportunity because we have our educational programs here where we train clinicians. We have our podcast here where we you know, are reaching 3 million people. And I happen to know we reach people who are looking because they used to call me. Because <laughs> I was on our podcast like two years ago when I didn't work for Rupa Health. And like people would call me and say, and I'm sure you guys get this too. Like I heard you on the radio and I knew I needed to come see you. Mm-hmm. I heard you on the radio and you described me or my kid. And I, I feel so lucky that I got to find you. And now I'm better, right? So I knew that this that social media and podcasts are a medium to reach millions more people than I was able to reach in one-on-one care. And we have an incredibly smart and well-equipped cohort of folks in America who want this information so that they can become more equipped to have really empowered conversations with their own physicians. And that's truly my goal. And I think like that's sort of, that was sort of a next step for me. As much as I like miss my clients, I happen to know that they're in very good hands. Um, because they're seeing my, my friends and colleagues at Sonari who I send my family to and they take such good care of them. So for me, it was like, all right, let's, let's go reach more people. And because there is no competition in healthcare until the last sick person is healed, we have a lot of work to do and we have to reach more people where they are in the car, at home, cooking, wherever they can put their, you know, their AirPods in and listen to this type of material that is a form of medicine, right? Until, until our job is done, we have to focus more on that. Right on. Resonates with me. Well, Dr. Kate, well, as I said, we've learned so much. You've given us so much. You've really reminded us to take the shame out of mental health and let's make it simple and approachable. So thank you so much for being here. Before we say goodbye, if you would be so kind, we'd love to learn more about you a little bit on a personal level. Would you answer our three rapid fire questions? (laughs) Sure. I have ones for you too. I'm actually glad you guys asked these. I want to start doing this one. Hit me. What do you got? All right. If you could live anywhere, Dr. Kate, where would it be and why? Oh, I'd have to stay here. Um, So I'm in Philadelphia. My family (laughs) is around me. 
I'm actually getting married in 30 days. Oh, congratulations. congratulations. Thanks. And I like just being in Seattle training it, for so long, I missed my family so much. And I feel like so incredibly lucky that everybody is like a two hour drive for me at, at most. Um, so even though I'm totally going to come visit you guys in <laughs> like, where yeah, where you are, like I, I would have to stay here. Yeah. It's the Fair best place on earth. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Next one. What is your favorite late night or b- before bedtime snack? If you're disciplined or not enough to never <laughs> night snacks. Unlike me. I'm huge. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of snacks. Um, I really love popcorn. Me too. And right, organic, y'all. But like, um, <laughs> popcorn <laughs> yourself. <Great. laughs> and you can put spices on it. When I moved to the Pacific Northwest, people would put like soup mix on their like <laughs> popcorn when they would camp. Yeah. So okay. that it would be like super spicy and like garlic and basil and they would like flavor their popcorn that way and so i have now experimented and i put like red pepper and uh, it seems like a pizza on popcorn is how it kind of seems yeah. um and then my other favorite snack is apricots and walnuts because dried mm-hmm. apricots are the number one source of potassium which i did not know until i really started learning about nutrition i would have told you it was bananas like chiquita banana won us all over 20 years <laughs> ago <laughs> That's great marketing. Great marketing. <laughs> oh my god! Awesome, but like, I have not yet met one single person who gets enough potassium on their mm-hmm. nutrient analysis when they come in the practice, and I wasn't getting enough either. And so now I make sure I have my apricots or my lentil pasta once a day, and I like naturally get there, and I feel really great. Um. So yeah, those are my those are my snacks. That's Solid. Awesome. Okay. Uh, last one. What would you do if you weren't a naturopathic doctor? If you could do anything. I'd probably be a writer, um, which it doesn't, it's not really fair because I do that now. Um, just because like I'm, I'd still be reaching people with medical information. How about something totally different? I'd be a full time foster parent. Yeah. Wow. So that's one of my passions. So um, my Beautiful. family was really affected um, by one of my close family members needing foster care when I was 18. And in Pennsylvania, you cannot be a foster parent until you are 21. Mm. As a result, my family member had to be cared for by strangers. Wow. Strangers who, out of the goodness of their heart, had chosen to become foster parents. And I remember just like as an 18 year old, like praying every night, like, I hope they're with nice people. I hope those people are doing this for the right reasons. I hope, you know, my family member is happy and safe. And like, it was just like gut wrenching for me. And it really opened my eyes to the fact that like, if we don't have good people volunteering to do that, um, then our kids are really stuck. Right now, there are, you know, over 100,000 kids in the US foster care system who are actively waiting for adoption. And that's a staggering number that, to most folks. And I think it's it's a silent crisis that doesn't get talked about enough. Um, particularly in the functional medicine sphere where we spend a lot of time talking about fertility and not a lot of time talking about the kids who already exist who need help. And so I think I would definitely be doing that. I already have um, become a a kinship guardian. Um, But if I could do that full time, I feel like I could probably really make like a a really big difference in a way that I care about. You're a caregiver through and through. I can see that. Yes. Absolutely. My gosh, Dr. Kate, thank you again for being here. Your heart has like shown through. um, And thank you for sharing your voice for for going from that one to one model to the one to many. And I know you're changing lives. We thank you for that. I know our listeners appreciate it. Um, Let everybody know where they can listen to your podcast or where to find you online. Absolutely. And thank you guys, because I know you both did the same thing. And I'm very thankful that you are doing that. I also want to thank you guys because like on behalf of Vibrant, you have created a lot of test panels that make it very easy for clinicians to identify the root causes of mental health disorders for their clients. Um, And your sales team is amazing. So like any doctor out there who wants to learn more about this, call your local Vibrant sales (laughs) rep um, because they are so knowledgeable and so helpful and so friendly and they'll make it easy for your clients during what is already a really hard time. Um, And I think that's part of what I value most is that like very friendly customer service aspect of what you guys do. So thank you both as well. Um, If you guys want to find me, um, you can go to the Root Cause Medicine podcast. 
um, or rupahealth.com. Part of what we're trying to do at Rupa University is educate more providers in this type of information and just highlight the practitioners who are teaching about it. So I learned a lot from people like James Greenblatt, Dr. James Greenblatt and Robert Hadaya, really amazing psychiatrists who were kind enough to share their information in trainings. And so part of our goal at Rupa Health, our only goal at Rupa Health is to make it easier to practice functional medicine. And so what that means is like, how do we save pra functional medicine practitioners time? Because this type of medicine takes a ton of time. How mm -hmm. do we make it easier for people to learn functional medicine so they can start to become part of this like response to the crisis of, of chronic illness in America? And how do we really highlight the amazing work that people are already doing in this space that folks may not know about? Um, and that includes you guys. So yeah, thank you for having me today. It's been great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kate. All right. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Until next time, stay vibrant. Thank you so much for being here today. Don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe so we can continue to pay it forward together. And remember, the key to longevity is knowledge. Keep learning, growing, and tuning in to the Vibrant Wellness Podcast to discover the latest insights and strategies for optimal health. Join us again next week. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational and informational purposes and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The views expressed by guests and hosts are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy of Vibrant Wellness. As always, consult your healthcare provider before applying any recommendations that you heard here today.